the very moment a machine took to the skies, it needed to change. As it quickly grew in power, so it exposed weaknesses in structure and design. Struts and wires gave way to streamlined wings. Cloth and wood to steel and aluminium. Years of combat made strength a priority and speed a necessity. And then, every once in a while, a change occurs. So radical, it renders everything that has gone before obsolete. Not evolution, but revolution. Such a change was about to hit the warplane. Today's jet fighter represents the state of the art in the continuing evolution of the warplane. Science is pushed to the very edge of its envelope to develop the next generation of airplane. From new materials, bigger, more powerful engines, the latest avionics, more sophisticated wing and weapons. Its mission dictates a precise balancing act of all these elements. Established over the fields of France in World War I, the missions have remained the same. The warplane, however, has never stood still. At the end of World War II, the piston-powered propeller plane was at the peak of its design. But as airplanes approached speeds of 500 miles per hour, the propeller's pulling power would drop drastically. It simply wouldn't function above a certain speed. And speed is the fighter's friend. To fly ever faster, something fundamental had to happen to the warplane. Wharton, England. This is a new breed of warplane. It uses no propeller or piston engine for power. Nor is it constructed of wood, cloth or very much metal. It's made, in fact, from mostly man-made carbon fibre composites. Everything about this plane is revolutionary. Eurofighter Typhoon, the culmination of 10 years of development and 100 years of knowledge. Rolling off the production line, Eurofighter is Europe's latest frontline warplane. And at the heart of this warplane is the one thing that forced all this change. The jet engine as a design item actually had occurred to people even before the First World War. But the first major figure to really study it intensively was Frank Whittle. Frank Whittle's son Ian, a former airline pilot, is also a respected authority on his father's work. My father had a vision of aircraft flying at very high speeds at very high altitudes when he was very young. His vision had been for a new type of engine based on a revolutionary and rather frightening concept to create an explosion, control it and harness the force between connected fans, a turbine and compressor. Frank Whittle had dreamed of the jet. He would use gas expansion in a way that would transform aviation. The year was 1929. Whittle was a mere 22-year-old. When he proposed his plan, airplanes looked like this and were doing a good job. Nonetheless, young Whittle took his dream to the top. Research scientist Arnold Griffiths. Griffith saw what he had to offer and unfortunately, for reasons that nobody has really been able to work out, he told his mentors that the idea was not viable, and so the Air Ministry rejected it. It was a huge blow to the young Whittle, and at a time when Europe was by no means a settled continent. Within three years, the Nazis would begin their ascent from the rubble of the Great War. Hitler would begin in secret to build the greatest air force the world had ever seen. In 1936, it was an air force he put to the test during the three-year Spanish Civil War, supporting the fascists 
of General Franco. The German Luftwaffe employed new technology. They understood its ability not just to wage wars, but to win them. By 1935, brilliant young German physicist Hans von Ohain had attracted the full support of airplane manufacturing giant Ernst Heinkel. His ideas for a new jet engine would put the Nazis on the starting blocks in the race for power. In England, on the outside track, Frank Whittle could only dream of such patronage. They could never do anything more than build one engine. So when that engine broke down, then they had to repair it with what they'd got. They didn't have enough money to test the compressor separately, test the turbine separately. But Whittle doggedly pursued his dream, and it very nearly cost him his life. The testing of the first engine was a bit hilarious because unbeknownst to them, some fuel had gathered in the combustion chamber arrangement they had, and they didn't know about this, so when they started it up, the engine started to pick up and it ran out of control. This early reconstruction of an engine test run features Frank Whittle himself. Father standing there with the fuel valve, and he closed the valve off, and the engine accelerated away. He used to say that he, he, he didn't run away because he was, he was so frightened he couldn't move. but I think it was his baby and there was no way he was going to leave it. Fortunately for the British authorities, he didn't leave it because although it was top secret, in Germany, Heinkel and von Ohain had their jet ready and the world's first jet plane, the Heinkel HE-178, flew on August 27th, 1939. In the arms race, that would determine the future of air power, one side was off and running. But at least Whittle now had an engine that worked. By mid-1939, the thing was demonstrating itself to be a very good piece of technology. And of course, that's 10 years after he would presented the idea to the air ministry. And only months before the biggest war of the 20th century. It may have been the whiff of cordite but at last, military commanders in England wanted what Whittle had to sell. After ten years of struggle, an exhausted Whittle finally saw his jet idea take off in May 1941 with the experimental Gloucester E-28. Germany, however, was still out in front in the most vital arms race in aviation history. The most deadly of all their innovations was the Mischerschmitt ME262. With its two jet engines slung in pods beneath its wings, the ME262 was 100 miles per hour, faster than the fastest allied piston engine fighters. On July the 25th, 1944, the ME262 became the first jet-powered warplane to see action. 